responding to persecution. That's us. Is this going to work for me? That doesn't sound very nice. Yeah. Well, <laughs> all right, I think I got it. All right, in, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 to 10, those verses known as the Beatitudes, Jesus there, he identifies blessings that are in store for his disciples who are there in the Beatitudes. They're described by various attitudes and characteristics expected and typical of disciples. And the last of the Beatitudes, of Beatitudes proper, is in verse 10. And there Jesus says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus here, he describes Christians as those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Persecution comes with the territory. It's part and parcel of being a disciple of Christ, a kingdom participant. During this time between Christ's first coming and his return. And that's why Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And the persecution here is for righteousness' sake, because the godly character and righteous living of disciples, that is a silent indictment against the sinful lifestyles of other people, and that incites resentment and inspires mistreatment. And this dynamic of righteousness, righteous living, inspiring mistreatment, it's noted in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 3 through 4, it says, For enough time has passed to have participated in the desires of the Gentiles, having traveled in licentiousness, lust, instances of drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and detestable acts of idolatry, regarding which they are surprised by your not running with them into the same flood of debauchery, vilifying you as you stand outside of that conduct. Indeed, the Lord himself pointed out in John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, that evildoers, they hate the light and they resist it because it serves to expose their works. Now, the blessing in store for Christians, those whose righteous lives stir persecution, he says here, is the kingdom of heaven. They enjoy the present blessings of life in the kingdom and will for eternity enjoy the glorious resurrection existence in the new heavens and new earth. So he says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then in the next two verses, so that's the last of the Beatitudes proper, then in the next two verses he expands on or elaborates on that last Beatitude, what he just said in verse 10. And he says, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So he calls his disciples to rejoice in persecution rather than be intimidated by it. Amen. You see, to rejoice in it rather than be intimidated by it. And Paul echoes this. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, when he calls them not to be intimidated or frightened in any way by those who oppose them. And Jesus mentions three forms of hostility that his followers will experience. They will be reviled or insulted. That's one. They will be persecuted. 
which covers all kinds of assaults on one's livelihood, property, liberty, body, life. And they will be lied about and slandered. And in verse 10, they're said to be persecuted for righteousness' sake, but here, the basis of hostility toward them, it's broadened. Here, it's on account of me, on my account. See, this includes persecution driven by hostility to Christians simply because they identify with and are loyal to Jesus. You see, this refers to the deeper root of the persecution. As Jesus said in John 15, verses 18 to 20, He said, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And he told the disciples in Matthew 10, verse 22, 22 that they will be hated. They will be hated by all for his name's sake. And that's why the Apostle John, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 13, he says, Do not be amazed, brothers, if the world hates you. Don't be shocked. Don't act like this is something strange. This is there. You see, hostility and persecution. It need not mean that the church is doing something wrong. As many people seem to think. They try to lay the blame for the world's hostility for the church at the church's feet, claiming it's a reaction to our being insensitive or too narrow-minded or too judgmental. But whatever ammunition we may have handed to the world, the fact is that we are in a spiritual war. We are in a spiritual war. As Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, for our struggle is not against blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world-controlling powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. If we were flawless, if we were fully Christ-like as we will be in the consummated kingdom, they would still hate us because they hate our Lord. That is the bottom line. They hate our Lord. So Jesus says in five, Matthew 5, 11 and 12, that in response to this type of mistreatment, Christians should rejoice and be glad. And the reasons Christians should have that response is that a great reward is in store for them. A reward that's kept in the security of heaven so that no power may deprive them of it. Just as the prophets will be rewarded for faithfulness to God despite the persecution they endure. For example, you see in Hebrews 11, everybody understood and was on board with the fact that the prophets, though persecuted because of their faithfulness, are blessed of God. And so this is what he's saying, you see, that disciples will likewise be rewarded despite their persecution for their faithfulness to the Lord Jesus. Between their death and Christ's return, they will be at home with the Lord as disembodied spirits, which Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 23, is better than this present life by far. But ultimately... Ultimately, they will experience the glory of full-bodied resurrection life in the new heavens and new earth when Jesus returns to finalize the kingdom that he inaugurated. Now, having instructed 
the disciples to rejoice in persecution by focusing on the reward in store for them, for those who endure, those who remain faithful. He then warns them about two other potential reactions to persecution. Two other reactions that persecution might produce. He says in chapter 5, verse 13, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You see, salt had many uses in the ancient world, most of which were beneficial. Most of the uses of salt were beneficial. It was then, as today, used as a seasoning that improved, and I would say vastly improves, <laughs> the flavor of food, and it also seems to have served some kind of hygienic function in the, in the case of newborns, whether it was a cleaning solution or whether it was used to retard bacterial growth and thus the odor in the swaddling cloth. It has some cleansing relationship with newborns, but its most critical use in the ancient world was as a preservative. That was its most critical use. It slowed the decay of meat. Yes. You see, which in the days before refrigeration, that was an extremely valuable effect. And whether one focuses only on salt's use as a preservative or includes in the reference its other beneficial uses, the quality of salt under consideration in the metaphor is the powerful and positive effect it has on that to which it is applied. That's this idea of you're the salt of the earth. Jesus says to his disciples in chapter 5, verse 10, that they are the salt of the earth because in living the way that Jesus calls them to live, they will have a powerful and positive effect on the world. They will benefit the world, not only by influencing its standards and its practices and raising the bar in this world, but by drawing people from this world into the kingdom of God. So they are having this powerful, positive effect on the world. But Jesus adds the warning. He adds the warning that if Christians abandon the faith, if they abandon the faith and thus surrender their distinctive character and ethics, if they become tasteless or unsalty salt, if they return to being like the world in the hope of deflecting the hostility and persecution about which he's been speaking, then they cease to be of any benefit to the world. You see, if instead of rejoicing and being glad in the face of insult, persecution, and slander, they jettison their distinctiveness and blend back in with the world. If they fall away, then they are suitable only to be discarded, to be thrown into the street. Now, the language at the end of, of verse 13, it seems to move beyond the loss of the benefit that they as faithful disciples would have on the world to indicating that the apostates themselves, those who have abandoned the faith, will be subject to divine condemnation. And the suggestion that salt that has lost its saltiness cannot regain, it, it's lost salt that it cannot regain it, that's a way of putting the danger of apostasy in the starkest possible terms. In other words, it's like the later writer of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 and 6, 
It's the same thing that he does. And I think Jesus is giving a worst case scenario to fortify the point about the danger. Because we know, right? We know that Christians can fall away, can be alienated from God, but not beyond the point of being recoverable. Amen. That's the whole thing about disfellowshipping. When we disfellowship somebody, they are out of fellowship with God. That is why they are disfellowship. It is God's plan to draw them to repentance to be restored. Okay, so we know that there, there is that. But there is a point and a step beyond that. Where somebody goes so far that they will not return. We would say that their repenting apparatus has been permanently disabled. You see, you can do that. You can wind up being like that. You see, they've in our vernacular, we would say that they have declared Jesus is dead to me and meant it. At that point, we might say that, as I say, their repenting apparatus, that has been disabled. They can't be restored because they will not be restored. They will not be restored. See, they have made a final, open-eyed rejection of the Lord. And Jesus, I'm convinced, he raises that specter. He raises that specter by way of a rhetorical question when he says, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? Well, if it's lost its salt, it can't be restored. That's right. And he raises that and says to raise the stakes of the apostasy against which he's warning. Okay, so this is what I think is going on. Then he says, he declares in 5, 14 to 16, he says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Amen. You see, light, that's a symbol of righteousness and enlightenment. That's what light's about. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says of himself, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Christians are to be the light of the world in that they're to show the light of Christ in the way they live. You see, Paul says that in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 15, verse 15. You see, we are a living demonstration of the arrival of the kingdom of God and the work of Jesus Christ. And that is how we're to be. And in that, we are to be lights in this world. Now, a city on a hill, you see, a city on a hill and a lighted lamp, those things relate to Christians being the light of the world in that just as concealment is incompatible with the nature of a city on a hill and contrary to the purpose of a lighted lamp, concealment is incompatible with the nature of a Christian and contrary to his or her purpose. You see, a living faith in Christ a saving faith in Christ will inevitably shine forth. It will inevitably express itself. It will result in a transformed life. That will come about. It cannot be concealed. See, a faith that doesn't manifest itself in work is mere intellectual assent. It's simply believing certain things are true without surrendering the, to those things. And that is what James calls in James chapter 2, 14 to 26, a dead faith. It is mere intellectual assent, which is insufficient to save. So if it is concealed, if it makes no observable difference in a person's life, it is not a biblical saving faith. Moreover, concealing one's Christian life, that's contrary. That's contrary to one's role as a source of light for the world. Right? We are to be 
lights for the world. And so concealing that, it's contrary to that role. It makes no more sense to hide one's Christ-motivated righteousness from other people than to put a lamp under a basket where it, where it cannot fulfill the purpose for which it was lit, namely to provide light. It makes no more sense to do that. Rather, Christians are openly to live exemplary lives. Not to parade our goodness, not to have people think that we're great, but rather it is to direct attention to God who is the source of that living and of every good gift. And notice how intent our culture is on stuffing Christians into the closet. This is what they're trying to do, prohibiting identifiable expressions of Christian faith in the public square. You need to keep that in the church. I don't want you actually living at work or in the public square anywhere your Christian faith because the world knows the power of that. And they don't want so they're busy stuffing us and trying to get us not to do that. Now Jesus is here warning about the temptation to go underground with one's faith, to hide it, because that's a predictable response to the hostility and the persecution about which he's been speaking. If instead of rejoicing and being glad in the face of insult, persecution, and slander, they seek to hide their Christian distinctiveness, they are subverting their mission. They're subverting their mission. Now, I'm afraid some have gotten the idea that rather than live holy lives before the world, we should live like the world so as not to appear self-righteous. See, we don't, we don't want people to think that you're self-righteous or we don't want to scare off potential recruits by making them think that they're going to have to change. You see, somehow that's, got, that's crept in. Well, guess what? Christ calls us to change. In fact, he calls us to come and die. And we cannot strip that out of the gospel and pretend that we still have the gospel. After all, I mean, Jesus did say in Luke chapter 14, 26 and 27, if anyone comes to me and does not hate idiom for love less, does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. Jesus did say that. He cannot be my disciple. And he insisted on being up front about what was required. Right? right after declaring that he must be the supreme priority in a disciple's life, Right after that, he says in Luke 14, 28 to 30, For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation, is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build but was not able to finish. And then he repeats the point with the illustration of the king going to war. He says, What I'm calling, there's nothing more serious than this. I'm calling you to a consecrated, surrendered, sacrificed life. And people need to know that. It's not just something you kind of waltz into. You don't do that. He said, people need to know what I'm calling you to. That's what Christian living is. And, he, and now the truth of the matter is that many people want desperately to change. Many people want that. They want the power Christ gives through the Holy Spirit to live a new life. A life that's no longer enslaved to sin. And when we downplay the radicalness of Christian living, we muffle the truth of the new life. When we do that, I think we reduce the appeal of Christianity rather than enhance it. I think people want 
to be freed. And as the more we tell them, no, 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 there's no difference, no difference. Live just the way I did before I was a Christian, trapped in drunkenness, vulgarity, immorality, you name it. Now it's just, except now you're saved. You know, that's the only difference. That's not the only difference. As I've said many times, a Christian is not the same person in a new situation. He's a new person in a new situation. Amen. You see, cleanse me from its guilt and power. Amen. You see, the hymn we sing, that's it. Now, as the forces of darkness continue to gather in our culture, as Christians continue to be demonized, as hate filled enemies of the society, obstacles to the cultural vision of the elites. This subject will become more and more pressing. And we need to have a clear understanding of what the Lord expects from us in persecution. And we need to transmit that to our brothers and sisters, to our children, to our grandchildren. And we need to maintain a vibrant faith through which we individually and as a community seek God's empowerment by the Spirit, we cannot, we cannot stand in our own strength. And we need that. Now, if any of you have any need with which you think we can uh, help, we're going to sing a song. You come and let that be known as we do that. 683.